Okay, give me a second. All right, so I would say perhaps for our study of friction, because this is something that we've already covered before, let's just run straight into a problem and try to solve it and then figure out what we can learn from that problem when it comes to friction. You know, this is normally not how I teach this class, but for materials that are, we've already covered before, especially things like friction, which you've learned in physics, I think this would be a, a better approach. So let's start by looking at example 8.1 from your textbook. That's a pretty simple example. It's a simple equilibrium example. We're going to have a crate. We're given some dimensions of that crate, right? We're told that the crate has a width of 0.8 meters. And let's say that this crate is homogeneous, right? It's uniform. And because the crate is uniform, that means that its center of mass will be at the centroid. And where is the centroid for this crate? Any ideas where the centroid of this crate is? It's in the geometric center of it? That's correct. It's a uniform crate. And if it's uniform, that means that the center of mass and the centroid are located in the same place. In this case, the centroid of the crate will be at its geometric center, which is just the center of a rectangle. Now, this crate is actually laying at rest in some solid surface. And we're going to apply a force of 80 Newtons. We're applying this 80 Newton force at an angle of about 30 degrees from the horizontal. Now this force is actually being applied at a distance of 0.2 meters from the ground. And then we're also told that this crate has a mass of 20 kilograms. All right, as a bit of a review, we already looked at, oh, I didn't write 20. As a bit of a review, we've already looked at centroid, right? This is a uniform crate. And given this information, we should have pretty much everything we need in order to determine the weight of this crate and what it acts on. So in, in order to use this as an opportunity to review everything else that we've already covered in class, um, I'd like to start first by determining the weight of this crate. and the location of the gravitational force. This way we can have a good idea of how to apply what we've learned before, okay? So first off, what is the weight of this crate? Or specifically, how do we find the weight of this crate? Any ideas? Uh, do we find the, I guess, weight or the force caused by the mass of the, the crate? And That's we correct. add that to the force caused by that 80 Newton force? 
let's let's ignore the force for now, right? Let's right. let's think of just the crate, right? How how do we find the weight of that crate? Uh, the mass, so which is twenty kilograms times nine point eight one. That's correct. Mass times gravitational acceleration is the weight. In this case, it would be 20 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. Bit of a review, right, of what we've already done. This gives us a weight of 196.2 newtons. And what does it act? Remember, we're dealing with a uniform crate, which means that the gravitational force is going to act at the centroid of the crate. So if we were to set our x-axis, our origin, to start here, let's just call this my, my location 0, 0. This is my x direction. This is my y direction. So if we set this as 0, 0, and let's say, right, well, let, let's say that this crate is actually 0.4 meters in height. If my coordinates of 0, 0 are starting the bottom left of the crate, where does the gravitational force act on? The centroid, right? Yeah, and where is that? 0 0.4 comma 0 0.2. That is absolutely right. In the x direction, we move half of 0 0.8, which is 0 0.4. In the y direction, we move half of 0.4, which is 0 0.2. So my force acts at 0.4 meters comma 0.2 meters. Good. So we found the weight of the crates. And we've also found the location of that gravitational force. Typically, if you don't know how to express the location and you, wanna, you don't want to use terms like center to the right, to the left, you can always set an origin, set a coordinate system with your origin, and then just express your location as a distance from that origin. It's absolutely right. Now, let's put on our statics hats for a second. If you were to look at this crate, how many forces can you identify acting on this crate just by identifying, just by looking at the crate? What do you think? Let's start with a simple one. If you take away all the environment and you leave only the crate, what force can you identify? Without the environment, wouldn't it just be the 80 Newton force? We have the 80 Newton force, right? We have a gravitational force that we calculated. Yeah. Now, gravitational force um, acts downward. This 80 Newton force is acting also downward. If this is the system, if this crate were in equilibrium, right, or in order for it to not keep moving downward, what needs to be holding it back? The normal force. That's correct. We have a normal force that is keeping the crate in place. But now let's look at what we have. You, you see that we have a force downwards and normal force upwards, and that normal force should counteract the effects of the vertical component of this 80 Newton force and the effects of the weight. However, this 80 Newton force also has a horizontal component. So this 80 Newton force has a horizontal component what needs to be acting on the crate in order to keep it in equilibrium? There's an equal and opposite horizontal force. There should be an equal and opposite horizontal force. That's correct. Any ideas of where that horizontal force comes from? You try to push a heavy box and it doesn't move. Why is that? If you're pushing it horizontally, the weight shouldn't, shouldn't really matter, right? So, so why is your heavy box not moving if you're trying to push it? the friction of the surface that it's resting on. Exactly, there's gonna be friction between the crate and the surface. Now we've already learned friction in our introductory physics course. 
But if we do need a refresher, um, let's start by first looking at, at drive friction, right? And as a review of physics, let's recall that drive friction, I'm just going to call it F sub F, is equal to some coefficient times the normal force, which I'm going to call F sub N. So my F sub F, which represents my friction force, is equal to this, coefi this uh, coefficient. And that coefficient is called the coefficient of static friction. And then we have a normal force. Remember, the normal force is the force perpendicular or normal to your plane. In this case, because my plane is a horizontal plane, my normal force will be vertical. But if my plane were inclined, my normal force would not be vertical. It would always be perpendicular to that plane. Now, you may recall that we've studied in physics different types of friction, right? We had a coefficient of static friction, which is the friction that helps keep objects in place. So have you ever noticed that when you are trying to push an object and there is friction between the object and its plane, typically you need to exert a little bit of extra force in order to actually get it moving in the first place. But once it starts moving, the force that you have to apply to it slightly decreases, right? So what we're going to do it today is we're going to focus on our dry friction and specifically our static friction, which is the friction that is exerted on this box, right? When the box is not moving. In other words, is a resisting friction, a friction that resists movement from any force that's acting on this crate. Of course, this is a static class. So static friction will be our main um, topic of interest here. So given this information, Let's say that for this crate and for that, the floor underneath the crate, the coefficient of static friction, mu sub s, is going to be 0 0.3 given. In order for this crate to be in equilibrium, we know that there has to be a normal force that counteracts the weight and the vertical component of the 80 Newton force. And there has to be a friction force that counteracts the horizontal component of this 80 Newton force. So if I were to ask you to find some values here, let's say to find the normal force, I think you would be able to do it, right? If I ask you to find the normal force, just find the vertical component of this 80 Newton force, and then the weight, add them up, and that's your normal force. And then if I want to ask for the friction force, Right, the normal force times this coefficient of static friction should give you the friction force. And assuming that everything is correct, that should be equal or to this um, 80 Newton force. However, um, this is a little bit too simple for us, right? I, I think we can actually make our problem a little bit more complex. Let's suppose that you are applying a force on this crate. And let's say that your force is applied up here on the top of this crate, okay? So if I'm applying a force up here, up here on top of this crate, two things can happen. Either my force will exceed the friction force and I will be able to move the crate. But what else can happen? If for some reason my force does not exceed my friction force, but it's still strong enough to actually move the crate. So if my force doesn't exceed my friction force, but it can still move the crate. It's not really moving horizontally. What do you think will happen to the crate? Let me rephrase. I have enough force to move this crate, but not enough to counteract this friction. So what happens to the crate? It's just standstill. Sorry, can you say it again? If your uh, friction, are you saying the 
the applied force is greater than the friction force? It's not greater than the friction force. Okay, if it's, it's not greater, then it's not moving. It, it'll stay static. All right, so you're thinking about this in terms of equilibrium of a particle. That's not necessarily bad, but this is a rigid body. For rigid bodies, remember, we don't, have, we don't just consider the magnitudes of the force. We also consider the location. Will the crate start to spin or like? Exactly, it tips. like tip up? That's actually correct, right? We have a friction force and we know that the friction force has to act at the point of contact between the crate and the floor. So if I'm applying a force up here, notice that we're gonna have a difference in, in direction. So the crate will tip. So what happens here? My force is actually not, my horizontal component of the force is actually not in line with this friction force, which means that there should be some moment caused by this force. Now the question is, based on the system, how can we determine if the crate is in equilibrium? You write it down. Remember when we studied equilibrium of a particle, we only needed to consider equilibrium or balance in forces in the X, Y, and Z directions. But when we started our study of equilibrium of a rigid body, we had to start considering the locations of those forces. So if we want to know if the crate is in equilibrium, we are going to have to consider not just the forces acting on this crate, but also the locations of these forces. So let's start this problem. We want to determine if this crate is in equilibrium. We typically can solve any problem, any statics problem, by first drawing a free body diagram. And my free body diagram here would be just a diagram of the crate. Remember, the free body diagram asks you to isolate the body, the rigid body, and then include as much information necessary in order to solve this problem. So I have my crate here, and let's start first with our forces, right? What forces are acting on the crate? We already know that there's an 80 Newton force. And this 80 Newton force is acting at an angle of 30 degrees and at a distance of 0.2 meters from the bottom. We also know that the crate itself has a height of 0.4 meters and a width of 0.8 meters, it's 80 centimeters. We know that there's a weight. We already calculated the weight of the crate. And because this is a uniform crate, we know that the weight will be acting in the centroid of the crate. And we know that this weight was calculated to be 196.2 newtons. Finally, we have a normal force and a friction force. I know that my friction force is acting along this bottom of the crate, so it acts along the line where the crate is in contact with the ground. I'm just gonna call this force F, friction. But now where is the normal force acting on? And, and I need you to think here. Normal force, right, is a reaction force. It depends on how much force you're actually exerting on your platform. Now, if this crate were alone, if there was no 80 Newton force and there was no friction force, then the normal force should be in line with the weight. That way there will be no rotation. But notice that here, we actually have an 80 Newton force would act, which actually contributes a vertical component at this end as well. So my question to you would be, is the normal force still going to be in line with the weight? Is it going to be in line with this vertical component of the 80 Newton force? Or is it going to be somewhere else altogether? What do you think? 
Would it be somewhere in between? Yeah, the probably AD somewhere in between. Yeah, that's correct. In a way. Should be somewhere in between, right? Because if your normal force were here and you have two downward forces to the left, we're going to have a counterclockwise rotation. Similarly, if your normal force were here and we have an additional force here, we would have a clockwise rotation. If your normal force were aligned with the weight, again, we would have a counterclockwise rotation. So in order for there to be no rotation, the normal force has to fall somewhere in between my two forces. Now, we really don't know where, but it's got to be somewhere in between, all right? So if it's going to be somewhere in between, then I'm going to have to place my normal force at some arbitrary point, and I don't know what that arbitrary point is. So I'm just going to draw my normal force vector, F sub n. And remember, the free body diagram has to include everything I need to solve this problem, and that includes distances, right? We know this gravitational force is actually acting right in the centroid, so it'll be at my 0.2 meters, but also at 0.4 meters in the horizontal direction. Now, this normal force has to be acting somewhere, but we don't know where. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set a, a point, and that point will be the point through which I'm going to study my moment. I'm going to study my rotation. If you look at how this system is set up, tipping is most likely to occur about the center of this box, this crate. So I think a good place to set my point for rotation, I'm just going to call this O, would be at the center of the crate. Now remember, you can set O wherever you want, right? O is simply going to be an, an origin of a new coordinate system that you're just going to use to determine your moment. That's all it is. So whenever you're calculating your moment, you can take your distance right from that point. Remember that when we're selecting points for which to study moments, we always recommend it, that you choose a point that allows you to eliminate as many forces as possible. So with that philosophy in mind, O is a good point to calculate your moments because it allows us to eliminate both this weight force and this friction force from the moment calculation. So O is actually a good point to choose our moments. Now, my normal force Fn is actually located at some unknown distance from O. Now, I'm going to call that unknown distance X. You can call it whatever you want. It's unknown. So I'm just calling it X. Now, putting all this information into a free body diagram, it, it seems like a lot of work, but it really does help us, right? It helps us to identify our forces and to be able to visualize them in order to do our calculations correctly. Now, we don't know where this normal force is. It seems that we're, in, we're, impl or we're inferring that the normal force will be more or less in between these two forces. But we could be wrong. However, it doesn't matter. If our normal force were located at a different direction, let's say to the other side of O, your answer would just be negative. So remember, we still have this thing where we can assume a direction. And if we assumed incorrectly, we just get a negative answer. And to that end, we still know the correct answer, which is pretty much our goal. So we drew our free body diagram. We need to determine if this crate is in equilibrium. I know we haven't done this in several weeks, but does anybody remember how to find out if a rigid body is in equilibrium? What equations do I have to maybe turn to? The sum of the forces in the xy direction and rotation? That's correct. This is a two-dimensional system. So we're going to have three equations of equilibrium to turn to, right? We have the sum of forces in the x direction, the sum of forces in the y direction, and the sum of for or moments about any point. We know that if this system were in equilibrium, let's first assume that it is. So if this system were in equilibrium, then the sum of forces in the x direction have to equal zero. So if we look at our, at our free body diagram, it's pretty easy to determine our sum of forces in the x direction. What do we have in the x direction? We have a horizontal component of this 80 Newton force. How do I calculate the horizontal component of this 80 Newton force? 
uh, 80 cosine of 30 degrees? That's correct. We have 80 times cosine of 30 degrees. Of course, this is in newtons. And we have a friction force. You know that friction force is always going to act. It's a reaction force as well, so it's always going to act opposite to the direction in which you're applying your force. So my friction force, if my, if my horizontal component of the 80 newton force is acting to the right, my friction force will act towards the left. So this will be minus my friction force. At this point, I don't know what my friction force is. However, if you look at here, at this equation, we only have one unknown. So we can actually solve for that friction force. The friction force that's acting towards the left then becomes 80 times cosine of 30. Remember, in order for this system to be in equilibrium, my friction force has to be equal to the horizontal forces acting on this crate. And this will be 69.3 newtons. Okay, good. I found my friction force. I think we're doing some good progress here, but we still need to determine that's not enough to let us know if this crate is actually in equilibrium or not. So we have a friction force of 69.3 newtons. Like Noah said, we can also apply an equation of equilibrium in the y direction, right? We know that the sum of forces in the y direction also have to equal zero. Now, if I look at my y direction, from left to right, I can see that there's a vertical component of this 80 Newton force. Now, because the horizontal component was 80 cosine theta, the vertical component should be 80 sine theta Newtons. But then um, I also need to consider the direction of this force. Notice that this force is actually acting in this direction. So the vertical component will be a downwards component. So I have to add a negative sign. From left to right, I can identify a normal force. And that normal force we know has to act always normal from that plane where the crate is at. So it will act upwards. So this will be a positive normal force. And then we have the weight. And the weight, as we know, always acts downward, right? Acts towards the center of the earth. Therefore, it will be a negative value. We have a friction force, but this friction force is actually on the horizontal plane. So there is no vertical component for this friction force. All this has to equal zero. And look again, we have one equation, but only one unknown. So we can solve for this normal force. The normal force here becomes 196.2 plus 80 times sine of 30. And we get a normal force of 236.2 Newtons. And finally, like Noah said, we can also find the sum of moments about any point. And if the system were in equilibrium, then those moments have to add up to zero. I'm gonna pick my point to be at the center of the crate uh, at the center of the bottom of the crate, because at this point, I can actually eliminate two forces from my equation, making it a simpler equation to solve. So sum of moments about point O. So what do we have here? We know that we have this 80 Newton force and it's acting at a vertical component with a vertical component and a horizontal component. So I guess starting from left to right, or so looking at this 80 Newton force first. This 80 Newton force has a horizontal component and a vertical component. We already know the horizontal component is 80 cosine 30. However, in order to calculate moment, we don't just need the force, the magnitude of the force. We also need to know the direction of the force from that point. This horizontal component is acting in this horizontal direction. So what is the perpendicular distance between this point and the horizontal component? 0 0.2. That's correct, 0 0.2. Now, if we follow a standard convention, the standard convention of having my positive to be counterclockwise, would this be a positive or negative moment? 
negative. A negative moment, that's correct. We also have a vertical component, and that vertical component is 80 sine 30. And we know that this 80 sine 30, this vertical component, is acting at a distance of 0 0.4 from the point of origin. And we also know that because this force is pointing downwards, it's actually causing a counterclockwise or positive moment. So it's going to be a positive value. Now, these are not all the forces that contribute to this moment. We also have a normal force, F sub n. Now, that normal force, we're not sure where it acts, but we do know that it acts at a location called x. So we're going to have an unknown normal force, F sub n. And we know that F sub n acts at a distance of x from the origin. And F sub n, if it were to the left of the origin, F sub n is actually causing a clockwise rotation. And because our rotation is clockwise, our sign will be negative. The other two forces don't need to be included in my moment calculation. Why don't, why don't these forces have to be included? Because they line up with our O point. Exactly, they line up with our w O point. Set. So there is no perpendicular distance, right? The distance is just zero, so there is no moment. Now, from our previous equation, we already found that that normal force was 236.2. So we plug 236.2 into this equation. We can now solve for our unknown value of x. So let's go ahead and use this equation to solve for our unknown value of x. So plugging all those values into my calculator, I get an x value of 0 0.00908 meters. So at this point, we've actually found everything we need to find for this system if it were in equilibrium, but we haven't answered our question yet, right? Our question was to determine if the crate is in equilibrium. We found all these values by assuming that the crate was in equilibrium. But now we need to determine if it's in equilibrium. So there's two things we're going to have to consider in order to determine if the crate is in equilibrium. Number one, will this crate rotate? And number two, will this crate actually, with, with the friction force, actually keep this crate in equilibrium? So we find those by doing a little bit of further analysis into this problem. First off, in order for this crate right, to rotate, the normal force would have to fall outside of the crate which means that there is not enough normal force to keep it from rotating. In this case, my normal force is actually located at barely nine millimeters to the left of my point O. As long as my normal force falls inside the crate, then the crate will not rotate. If my normal force is, if this X value would have been greater than 0 0.4 meters, then the crate would have rotated. So in this problem, my x is actually smaller than 0 0.4 meters, which means that this normal force actually falls somewhere in this range. Because the normal force falls somewhere in this range, that means that the crate will not tip, right? It will not tip. So if I were to put together a, least, a, a list of requirements, for this crate to be in equilibrium. My first um, requirement would be that A, X, or at least the absolute value of X has to be smaller than 0 0.4 meters. 
Why am I saying the absolute value of x? Any ideas? Why not just x? Remember that x is measured from this origin point O. So why do you think I have to include that absolute value sign? In case the uh, the point that the normal force acts at is to the right of that point O, but still under the crate. That's correct. Right. If my normal force were to the right, we would have gotten a negative value for x. And that negative value cannot be smaller than or greater than 0 0.4, right? Or smaller than 0 0.4. It has to be up to negative 0 0.4. So we can just say, we can say that x can fall between negative 0 0.4 and 0 0.4. Or we can just say that the absolute value of x has to be smaller than 0 0.4. I may actually even say smaller than or equal to 0 0.4. So that's one requirement. My x is actually smaller than 0 0.4, so the requirement is actually met. But then I have another requirement, right? And my other requirement is, is the friction from this uh, platform from the ground, is that enough to actually hold the crate in place? Now we can figure that out by using our equation of friction, right? We, we've learned that friction is a coefficient times a normal force. Now this, we have two types of coefficients, right? A coefficient of static friction and a coefficient of dynamic friction. A coefficient of static friction is the friction when the object is static. In other words, it tells you how much force do you actually need to get it moving in the first place. But once it's already moving, the coefficient of friction actually changes. Now, in this case, we care if the crate is in equilibrium. In other words, we care for the crate to be static, which means that we only care about the static friction on this crate. Now, the question is, is this friction force capable of withstanding the 69.3 Newtons required to keep this crate static, right? In order for this crate to be static, my friction force has to be 69.3. The question is, is this friction force capable of getting 69.3 Newtons? Let's see. Our friction force is equal to the coefficient of static friction, which was 0 0.3, times my normal force, which I calculated to be 236.2. I get a static friction of 236.2 times 0 0.3. I get a static friction of 70.86. I'm just going to round up to 70.9. So what do I do with this information? 70.9, remember, that's the amount of force that you need to apply to this crate in order to get it moving because that's the maximum force that the friction from this, um, from this platform can provide to the crate. The required friction force to keep it in equilibrium is 69.3. So that means if my friction force, right? If my friction force is less than or equal to 70.9, then my crate is in equilibrium. Because if my friction force were greater, if I calculated here something greater than 70.9, then I am not in equilibrium. I'm not in equilibrium because the friction force actually cannot withstand that, that push. But in this case, our friction force is less than 70.9, which means that the crate is in equilibrium. I like this problem because it covers a little bit of everything that we've covered so far, right? We've talked about centroids, we talk about equilibrium, not just of particles, but of rigid bodies. But now we're actually adding in a couple of more conditions, right? We've already done some work where we had to consider rotation of objects, and now it's a good time to actually include those uh, potentials for rotation into our analysis of rigid bodies. So at this point, are there any questions with this problem? I know it's, we went straight into a problem, but I think it's a, it's a good start in order to study friction because friction, really, it's something that we already learned before. I think the challenge here is going to be to combine friction with everything that we've learned in class so far.
So are there any questions at this point? All right, if there are no, if there are no questions, let's try a different problem. I'd like to solve the next example in mind, which is uh, 8.2. So you can look at the figure in your book. There is a, a photograph but I'll just read the problem statement, right? It says, it is observed that when the bed of the dump truck is raised to an angle of 25 degrees, the vending machines that are inside the truck will begin to slide off the bed. So given that information, we would like to determine the static coefficient of friction between a vending machine and the surface of the truck bed. So let me do a little bit of a diagram here so you understand what I'm talking about. We have a truck that carries vending machines. And then when the truck bed inclines itself to an angle of about 20 degrees, then those uh, bending machines start to slide off. In other words, that's when our friction force is not enough to keep the bending machines in place. I'm gonna just give some typical dimensions of a bending machine so that we can use for our analysis. Let's say that these machines have a center of gravity, not at the geometric center, it should probably be a little bit lower, right? Um, just in order to prevent tipping, but let's say that these machines have a center of gravity at a distance of about 2.5 feet from the ground. And at its center, right? So at the center. So that means that on this direction, we have 1.5 feet. On this direction, we have 1.5 feet. Now, this is actually all the information we're going to be given, okay? We, we know that the crate will be inclined at an angle of 20 degrees, and at this angle, the vending machines will start to slide off. I'd like to use this information to determine the coefficient of static friction. In other words, we want to use this diagram to determine my coefficient of static friction, mu s. I also want to know if we can, if there's any way we can prove mathematically that the vending machines will slip instead of tip. In other words, if you know that if you were to incline this at some level, if the friction is actually greater than what's necessary, these machines, instead of sliding off nicely, they can actually just tip, right? So using a similar analysis to what we did with our crate example, I'd like to analyze these vending machines and figure out if there's any way we can show mathematically that these vending machines will not tip. You can see the photo from your book. The photo actually shows an example of the vending machines actually tipping, not uh, sliding off. So if you see the photo, you can see the vending machine, you can see the guy frustrated, and then you can see some dust, okay? So, Let's go ahead and solve this problem. We're asked to find the coefficient of friction and all that is good, but we're not really given that much information, right? We don't really know too much about the system. Um, all, all the information that was given to us is just the location of the weight of the gravitational force of the vending machine and the angle of inclination, but that's it. So we have to see first if that information that's given to us is actually enough to determine that coefficient of static friction. When we're dealing with a problem where we want to assess, right, assess forces acting on a rigid body, what's the first step to solving that problem? Free body diagram. Yeah, that's correct. We can start by drawing our free body diagram. 
Of course, in this case, the body is the vending machine. I can draw my free body diagram. And just to make my analysis a little bit easier, I'm going to set my x and y axes to be simply normal and tangential to this crate. In other words, I'm just going to say that this is my x axis, this is my y axis. The reason I'm doing this is because it just makes it a little bit easier for me to quantify my forces and run my equations of equilibrium. I can do my x-axis to the left, I can do my x-axis to the right, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to get the same answers anyway. So I have my x-axis and my y-axis. What I know from this free body diagram is that this crate and also my coordinate system is inclined at 20 degrees from the horizontal. I know that there are forces acting on this crate. Can anybody identify which forces are acting on this crate based on the diagram? Or based on the, yeah, based on the diagram, what forces are acting on the crate? Is there weight? Yep. We have gravitational force, which is the weight of the crate. We know that that weight of the crate will act at the center of gravity that was already given to us. I'm just going to call it FW. We don't know what that weight is. We don't have any mass information. We don't have any information to give us the location or the magnitude of that weight. So all, all I'm going to write is what I know. I know that there is a weight. I know that it's acting downward in a downward direction. And I know that it's acting at 2.5 feet in the y direction and 1.5 feet in the x direction. Good. What else? Is there any other force acting on this bending machine? Remember, we analyze our our bodies by first going over the assumption that they are in equilibrium. So in order to, for this to be in equilibrium, what other forces should be acting on this vending machine? Normal force and friction force. That is absolutely right. We have a normal force and a friction force. I'm going to start by drawing my friction force. You know, the friction force will act opposite of the direction of intended movement, which means that my friction force actually acts along this line, wherever there is contact between the vending machine and the ground. Now we have a normal force. And remember, the normal force should help us to prevent rotation. We don't really know where that normal force is acting. I'm just going to give it an arbitrary location. I'm just going to say it's acting here. And what is here? Here is simply a distance of x from the center of gravity. Okay, so that's all I know. Okay, that's all I know about my friction force. That's all I know about my normal force. That's all I know about the weight of this vending machine. Not enough information given, maybe not even enough to calculate all of the magnitudes, but remember the purpose of this exercise is to determine the coefficient of static friction for these vending machines and the truck bed, which is where the vending machines are at. So once we draw a free body diagram, we can now move on to apply our equations of equilibrium. Remember that I'm setting my x and y axes to be inclined along with the direction of the, of the truck bed. So I have my sum of forces in the x direction. And because my axis is pointing in this direction, I'm just going to say my positive is going to be towards the top left. And what forces do I see? Well, I can clearly see a friction force acting towards the top left. So I have my friction force, which is along the positive x direction. So, okay, that's good. Is there any other force that's acting along this x direction? Is it F F F yeah. Exactly. There, there's a X component for that weight. 
Now, at this point, I don't want to confuse you. I, I actually wrote down this angle incorrectly. I just realized the book actually gives us an angle of 25 instead of 20. Thankfully, we haven't done any calculations. Normally, I would just calculate with 20, but because we haven't done any calculations yet, I'm just going to go ahead and fix it before we start calculating. Okay, so we are looking at an angle of 25. Now, remember, if you need a little bit of refresher in your geometry, remember your weight is acting downward and your x-axis is at 25 degrees from the horizontal. Now, the weight itself, right, is at 90 degrees from the horizontal. So if you were to draw a normal line, a line along the y-axis, then you would know or you would see that this angle is 25 degrees because all you're doing is you're shifting this by 90 degrees. And that's how you get your angle of 25 degrees. Now, given that information, we can see, right, that the x component of the weight will be simply the magnitude of the weight times sine of 25 degrees. And because it's going to be acting in the negative x direction, I'm going to give it a negative sign. So minus my weight times sine of 25 degrees. OK, perhaps not very helpful. I have one equation, but two unknowns. Not really sure what if I can do much from that. But let's leave it at that, and let's see what else we can figure out from the other equations of equilibrium. Remember, you may not always solve your equations on the first try. You may have to run multiple equations of equilibrium in order to find common ground and then start solving them. So I can turn to my sum of forces in the y direction. And in this case, my y-axis points in this direction. So I'm just going to set this as my positive y-axis. And for my sum of forces in the y direction, you can see that there's a normal force already acting along the y-axis. So I'm just going to call this f sub n. But there's also a y component of this weight. And the y component of the weight you can see here is simply um, the magnitude of the weight times cosine of 25. So minus my weight times cosine of 25. Again, not very helpful. We added an equation, but we also added one more unknown. So we have two equations, three unknowns, not really helpful in terms of solving this problem. But that's OK. We can continue to move on. We can now look for the sum of moments. Remember, if you can't solve your equations of equilibrium on the first try, try the next equation. That doesn't work, try your sum of moments. That doesn't work, try your sum of moments at a different point where you have more information. Remember, for your moments, you always pick a point that allows you to cancel out as many forces as you can. So we take my sum of moments to be equal to zero positive counterclockwise. I'd like to pick a point here somewhere in this crate that will allow me to cancel out as many forces as I can. Any ideas on what that point may be or where that point may be located? Would it be about the center of mass? I think my problem here is that if I pick a center of mass, I can cancel out my weight, but there's still a friction force that I have to consider. And there's also, there's also going to be a normal force. The normal force wouldn't be canceled unless x equals 0, but we don't know what x is, right? So let's try a different one. Remember, we want to cancel as many forces as possible. Or I guess in this case, we want to cancel at least two forces, right? Let's think for a second, right? Our, our, our goal here is to reduce the number of unknowns in order to solve this system. So if I were to set my point here, I would cancel the x and y components of my weight. But even though I'm canceling two components, I'm only canceling one unknown, which is my fw. I want to cancel as many unknowns as I can. So how can I do that? 
can you set it along the x axis at the point f of n? Yeah. Or where f of n meets the vending machine? Yeah, that's correct. Notice that if we set our point where f of n meets the, the vending machine, we cancel our f of n because there is no perpendicular distance. But we also cancel our friction because there is no perpendicular distance. So we know that wherever we set our point, if our point is going to be at the bottom of the machine, it's always going to cancel out friction. So if we want that point to cancel out friction and our normal force, we can set it where the normal force meets the vending machine. So I'm going to call this my point O. And I'm going to run my momentum equation. My sum of moments about O will now only include right, my weight component in the x and the y direction, and that's it. And that's good because even though we're adding a new equation, we're only adding one term that it's already there, right? So we're reducing the number of unknowns in our equations. So what do I have? For my sum of moments about point O, I have my x and my y components of the force. I'm going to start with the y component because that one seems to be a little bit easier here. Notice that my y component acts along this direction. So if my y component acts along this direction, I know that my y component is my weight times cosine of 25, and it acts along this direction. We know that this point is at a distance of x. We don't know what x is, but we know that this point is at a distance of x from my normal force. So what I have is my weight times cosine of 25 times my unknown x force. And this, as you can see, causes a counterclockwise rotation. Therefore, my moment is positive. I have an x component of my weight. This x component is acting at a distance of 2.5 feet. So my x component is fw sine of 25 acting at 2.5 feet from my point. And because it causes a clockwise rotation, it's going to be a negative value. And here, hopefully, hopefully we, we can see some, something interesting happen here, right? First off, we did add one additional unknown x. But do you see anything interesting, anything we can do to simplify this equation? Can you simplify out FW? Exactly, right? We can factor out FW and notice that we don't even need it here because since all this equals zero, then my FW will not affect this equation. So I can actually just divide both sides by FW and take it out of my moment equation. And I get X times cosine of 25 minus 2.5 times sine of 25 equals zero. And this gives me just one unknown that I can solve for. Now let's go back to our problem, right? Remember, we want to figure out what the coefficient of static friction is for this problem. We have several equations. We have a lot of unknowns. So we need to do a little bit of digging here in order to figure out how to calculate that coefficient of static friction. So first thing I think you should try to ask yourselves is, how is the coefficient of static friction related to any of these terms here. Is that coefficient of static friction, is that related to any, any one or more of the terms here? What, what do you think? What is the coefficient of static friction used to determine? So we use the coefficient of static friction to calculate what? Friction. 
Yeah. So that means that my friction is calculated with my coefficient of static friction. We know that friction force is equal to coefficient of static friction times normal force. And friction force and normal force are both terms that you can find in this equation, right? So that means that even though we don't need to know the magnitudes of friction force and normal force, we can still use them to find that coefficient of static friction. So let's see how that works, right? How, how can we relate friction force and normal force? We have two equations here. Perhaps we can try to combine these two equations, right? So what do we have here? I know that normal force can be related to my weight. So from this equation, I'm gonna call this equation one, equation two, equation three, do not confuse myself. So from equation two, I know that normal force is equal to my weight times cosine of 25. Now, that's what I know so far. Now, from equation one, I know that my friction force is equal to my weight times sine of 25. Now, you may not realize it here, but the fact that you are adding or using this equation in our problem, this means that we have one more equation to solve, right? And what does this equation say? My friction force is equal to my coefficient of static friction times my normal force. I have an expression for normal force and I have an expression for friction force. So let's substitute that. Let's substitute equations one and two into equation four. So my equation four tells me that friction force and friction force is weight times sine of 25 is equal to the coefficient of static friction times my normal force. And from equation two, my normal force is weight times cosine of 25. I can rearrange to solve for this coefficient of static friction. And I get that my coefficient of static friction is equal to weight times sine of 25 divided by weight times cosine of 25. Or simply, tangent of 25 degrees. So notice that we don't really need to know the weight of the bending machine in order to find the coefficient of friction. All we need to know is at which angle does the object start to move. And of course, this is assuming that the only forces acting on it are gravity, right? But if our object starts to move at an angle of inclination of 25 degrees, that means that my coefficient of static friction is simply tangent of 25 degrees. Any questions with how we solve this problem? Uh, a question about this problem, not yep. necessarily solving it. Uh, based of, off of this, does that mean the coefficient of friction for this type of scenario is just the tangent of whatever angle? Yep. For this scenario where there's only gravity force acting. Yep. And actually this angle has a name. This is actually called the angle of repose or repose. And that's the angle at which an object starts to slide or slip um, under the influence of gravity. Any other questions? So, so if we, oh, yeah, go ahead. If we uh, real, realize it sooner, did we not need to go to equation three and find some of the moments? Not for my coefficient of static friction, but I do want to yeah. use it in just a second. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
So I guess this is a good uh, introduction to this. So I would like to know, all right, I know my coefficient of static friction, but then how do I prove mathematically? I, I mentioned this earlier. Right? I wanted to prove mathematically that this vending machine is actually going to slide and it's not going to tip. So the way I do that is by doing my moment analysis. Now from this moment equation, we see that x is actually the only variable in our equation and we can solve for it. So solving this for x, I'm gonna have 2.5 times tangent of 25. So this gives me 1.17 feet. Now remember, x is the location of the normal force, right? So the normal force, the location of the normal force tells us if this crate, if this vending machine will tip or not. And what are the requirements in order for this vending machine not to tip? What do we know about the normal force? Where does the normal force have to be located in order for this not to tip? In other words, what are the limits of my x value? I'm just gonna call it absolute value of x. Realistically speaking, where does the normal force have to be in order for it to actually show that the crate is not tipping? Or the vending machine? Between the edges of the bottom of the vending machine. Exactly, right? The normal force has to be somewhere in the bottom of the vending machine. It cannot be outside of it. That means that if we're measuring from the center, my absolute value of x has to be less than or equal to 1.5 feet in order for this vending machine not to tip. My x value found was 1.17 feet, which is actually in line with what I need. That means that the normal force is actually on the vending machine. And that shows, at least mathematically, that this vending machine will not tip. It will slide. 